Well, good morning, everyone. Well, today, boys and girls, we're going to be back in the book of Mark. Um, it's 72 verses. I couldn't get through it in one session, not even two sessions. So we're going to try it number three. We're looking at the life of Jesus Christ and everything that he did for us and how he lived. Um, but let's pray. Our Father and our God, our hearts cry out to you today because we need you. We need you to strengthen us in places where we're weak. We need you to encourage us in areas in which we're frail. Lord, we need you to speak comfort to us, to remind us that we're yours. I thank you for today. I thank you for your word, for all of these people that have submitted themselves to come in here. I pray that you might have your way in each one of us, that you'll speak to our hearts, that you might enlarge us in our hearts, in our capacity to love and be thankful as you add to our knowledge. So Lord, just guide us along as, as you so lovingly do and help us to be cooperative for those that aren't here, Lord. We pray for them, that you be with them wherever it is that they are, that you would be encouraging, strengthening, speaking to them on this, the day in which we remember you and we set aside to seek your face. Help us, Lord, now as we, as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're back in the book of Mark. Boy. Previously here at Grace, we were looking at the life of Jesus, and in chapter 14, we looked at his betrayal, and um, beginning in verse 1 of Mark 14, and the Last Supper, there's a whole number of things. And we also looked last week at Jesus and him being prepared for sacrifice. And so as we go through the Gospels, we're coming to the end of Mark, culminating with the crucifixion. We saw the Pharisees and the chief priests get together and conspire against him. And then this woman with this alabaster uh, flask where she dumped this ointment all over Jesus. And she did this in preparation of his death and his burial. And uh, that was the very spark that sparked Judas to rebel and actually say, well, how much will you give me if I turn him in? Because he was incensed at this outpouring of worship, essentially, for Jesus that got him so angry and so jealous that he went and betrayed Jesus. Jesus said, I need you to go prepare a room. So when you go into town, look for a guy who's carrying a water jug, follow him. And go into wherever he's going and say, where is the room prepared for me and my disciples? And so he sends two disciples out and they find a man carrying a water jar, which is unusual. And they follow him and they say, where is the, where is the room that the master needs prepared? And they take him, right? Take them right to it. And so uh, they went on that impossible mission and the Lord uh, gave them grace. The Lord might cause you to be on an impossible mission sometime soon. Know that you can trust him if he calls you to do that. So Jesus comes later in the evening with the disciples and they sit at the table, uh, not the one that you see by Michael, uh, uh, by um, Da Vinci, but one that's about the height of a coffee table or a little bit lower and they sat on their sides. We know that Jesus was there and he washed the disciples' feet and there was a lot of other information throughout the scriptures that isn't in the book of Mark. And Jesus then announces, one of you is going to betray me. And they all said, well, not me, Lord, not me. Is it me? Is it me? Oh, it's probably me. They had this big conversation. You can imagine having 12 disciples at a table and everyone talking at once. It might be like a family dinner at your house. And Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And then Peter raises up and he says, I'll never betray you, Lord. I don't care all these schmucks there, you know, all these weak and faith men but I'll never betray you. And he goes, you know, I'm, Peter, it's, by the time the rooster crows twice in the morning, you'll have denied me three times, which makes it look like Peter's actually the guy that's going to betray him, but it's Judas who dips in the cup with him, and Jesus says, go and do what you must do quickly. And he leaves to go tell them that he's on his way, and he's going to be up on the Mount of Olives at the place called Gethsemane, the wine press. 
After that, Jesus goes with the disciples and he goes into down into the Kidron Valley, he crosses over that small stream, which is running with blood right now because all of the sacrifices happening in the temple are now running into the Kidron Valley and they step over it and they go up into the Mount of Olives and Jesus tells the disciples to kind of stay put here while I go forward and pray. And then he tells them to watch while I go and pray. And he goes to pray and he prays a prayer and he says, Father, if this cup can pass from me, you can do anything. If you could just take this cup away from me, but not my will, thy will be done. And Jesus struggling with his humanity and his deity and sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. And he comes back and his three trusted disciples that have come a little bit closer to where he is are sleeping. And Jesus wakes them and says, Simon, are you sleeping? And calls him Simon, which is his original name, which means hearing, but he's not hearing anything. So it's kind of ironic. And then he says, stay awake and pray so that you won't be tempted. He tells the disciples, stay awake and pray so you won't be tempted. And he specifically says this to Peter. And it's very important because Peter's about to be tempted. Because coming up over the rise is a giant contingent of soldiers. And they're coming with Judas. And they're coming to take Jesus. So we left off with that scenario. And we see as they try to take Jesus, Peter still full of himself, pulls a sword and he says, shall we draw our swords, Lord? Like you're way outnumbered here and you're going to defend Jesus? You're going to defend God. God the Son, you're going to defend him. Uh, do, do you feel like you have to defend God in a culture that comes against him and says things? It's funny. It's funny. Well, wait a minute. No, you got that all wrong, man. I didn't. Anyway, I'm thinking of myself. I used to be a great arguer when I was younger. I've lost taste for it because I find the harder you try to force people into things, the more they resist. And unless the work of the Holy Spirit is done in someone's heart, they can't hear you. And we have to be more reliant upon him and less reliant upon ourselves. And I think that's the lesson that Peter learns. He pulls a sword. He, he goes to, to take somebody out and he just captures an ear and we're told that this is the servant of the high priest, Malchus. So we even get his name and we know which ear it is. It's his right ear, which is surprising because last week there was a shot fired and there was a bloody right ear. But what Jesus did is he healed him. He says, permit this. And he bends down and he picks up the ear, you know, and, and puts it back on and heals this guy. And he's, he's the, the high priest's servant. And so he tells Peter to put the sword away. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. If that's the kind of thing you're going to do and you're going to rely upon your own strength, it'll be by your own strength that you fall. And so Peter puts it away and they take Jesus away. All the disciples scatter. And as they're moving along and they're taking them away, there's a young man following behind them. And he's got a sheet on, and that's all he's wearing. And his name's John Mark. History tells us John Mark's walking behind them, and the soldiers get a little queasy about that. So they go to lay hold of him, and they can only grab his sheet. And so what he does is he leaves the sheet, and he runs away naked into the dark. It's the first streaker. <laughs> if you young people remember that. It used to be a thing. I, I, I look back and say, wow, that and pet rocks. <laughs> Tamagotchis. And, you know, like there's so many fads, you know, that we follow. But John Mark runs away. And so that's where we left it last time. We're going to look at Jesus before the Sanhedrin and before the chief priests. Verse 53 of chapter 14. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, 
right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with his servants and warmed himself at the fire. Peter follows at a distance. You know, that's not what he promised Jesus, is it? I don't care all these guys, they'll fall away. I'm never going to follow. And he's following Jesus, but at a distance. I wonder how many disciples would be in that category. Well, I follow Jesus, but at a distance. You know, I'm not close. We're not intimate. <laughs> I don't really know him, but I know about him, and I can kind of, you know, I see things, and I understand certain things about the Bible. But I'm following him far off, which isn't where... Peter should be. But Peter's following far off, and we find out from the other Gospels, he's got a partner with him who's John, who's the younger of all of the disciples, and he's actually going as well and following behind him. Following Jesus at a distance is hardly what he promised him. The next thing that we read in the Scriptures is how Peter is blending in with his enemies and warming himself at their fire. Well, it's interesting because if you want to hide from someone, or if you want to hide from a bunch of people, the worst place to be at night is at a fire. Just letting you know, if any of you are on the lamb and you're looking to hide, <laughs> coming to the fire and having all of these other people who were against you and against your Lord, that's not the place where you want to be. So we see, first of all, Peter is following at a distance. The next thing you see, he's warming himself at their fire. You know, it's kind of the progression of our hearts, isn't it, when we backslide? First of all, there's distance between you and Jesus, or you and the Word, or you and fellowship. And then pretty soon, you're just enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season and warming yourself at the fire of the world. And so Peter takes a familiar trek, as the rest of us do. And yet, hiding and half measures can only be a means of hiding or escape, but only temporarily. You know, Peter gets found out if you read the rest of the story. He gets noticed. Because if you know the living God, and if the Spirit of God lives in you, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You cannot be hidden. You can't. Like a city on a hill. That's who you are. I remember as a young Christian trying to warm myself at the world's fire and warm myself at my enemy's camp. And I got found out. I had people come up to me and say, aren't you one of them reborn Christians? <laughs> and I didn't correct them. In fact, I felt embarrassed. Because what in the world am I doing in this place, doing what I'm doing? And these people know I belong to him, and they're wondering why I'm there. Felt kind of naked all of a sudden, and found out. Because it's only a temporary measure if you're going to try to hide. Because if you're adopted by the king of kings, and he's made you his own, he's put his seal on you, which is the Holy Spirit of God, which the scripture teaches is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Amen. He doesn't just put he doesn't just put cash on you to say I'll come back. He puts himself in you to say he's coming back. Amen. And so we see Peter following at a distance, warming himself at the fire and trying to blend in with the enemies of Jesus Christ. And it's easier than you might think. The scripture talks about how this would happen. Isaiah 53, 6, a prophecy written long before Jesus came that we all like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The scripture teaches us that every single one of us, everyone is a sinner, everyone falls short of the glory of God. There is not one of us born perfect, pure, and unselfish. We're all tainted we got it from our parents. Don't blame them because you're going to pass it on to. And you don't want to be blamed for your kids' sins, right? You have to bear the guilt of that. I'm sure you people don't struggle with those things, but I do. 
We all like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of all of us. And that's the story of Jesus Christ, that he took on our sin. And it's by having faith in that finished work that we are saved. It's not by anything that we do. It's not by punching a card and attending church. For any of you that may have that misconception, this, is, this doesn't get you saved. What gets you saved is having faith in what Jesus did for you because he took away our sin. Amen? Amen. <coughs> now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What, what is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. You know, that's going to be a remarkable feature when he goes before Pilate because he doesn't answer the false witnesses. You know, you don't need to give a response to every accusation levied you, do you? In fact, when you do, it almost makes you look guilty, right? I, I, I think I saw you coming out of that bar. No, you didn't. <laughs> I already look guilty. I'm sitting here trying to deny it and argue. Jesus didn't open his mouth because no one could agree. All of their stories were wrong because they were false witnesses. They were probably paid off to lie. By the way, one of the Ten Commandments, one of the big ten is, you shall not bear false witness. Amen. Which, you know, we like to say, don't lie. Well, it's more than that. Because they were telling kind of the truth, weren't they? Because you remember, Jesus did say, when he went into the temple, he overturned the tables. And he said, get out of here. This is my father's house. It's a house of prayer. And you turn it into a den of thieves. And they said, well, what by, by what authority you know, what are you going to do to prove to us you have the authority to say what you're saying? And he says, destroy this temple and it will raise it up in three days. That's exactly what he said. Except all of the false witnesses got it wrong, right? Built with hands and, you know, they got it all confused. And none of them could agree. By the way, this was an illegal proceeding. Number one, you don't have court proceedings at night. In, in the Jewish tradition, you don't do that. Number two, there needs to be a vote that happens. Number three, I mean, there's all of these things. They're just going against all policy, and they're calling up false witnesses, probably paying them off. They just want to murder Jesus. And you're never to have court during a festival, one of the feasts, the three big ones especially. You're not to have court. Court is postponed. It's, it's you know, it's like Christmas Day, no court. And yet they assembled in the middle of the night. Jesus has three separate religious trials. Number one, he goes to Caiaphas, who's really the high priest. And then he goes to Annas, who's the brother, who's the, the son-in-law of the high priest, who the Romans would rather deal with him because he compromises more. And so they said, you're the high priest. And they were like, okay, whatever you say. So that you, have, you have these two high priests, if you will. Because once you're a high priest, you're a high priest forever. It's like being a president and then having secret service with you 24-7. Did you know that that was a benefit? Does that change any of your minds? No, me neither. I'd rather be so unimportant nobody looks for me. So he goes to the high priest and they pay people to lie because they want to murder him. Well, that's two out of the Ten Commandments, which that, that's pretty bad. And they're tromping on all their own laws. And Jesus answered them nothing. Because there was nothing to say, except you're wrong. In John 2, 18 to 22, it says, So the Jews answered and said to him, 
What sign will you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus said to them. You see, it wasn't until later these guys put together everything Jesus said after the Holy Spirit came and helped to give understanding. But Jesus said, if you tear down this, you're going to tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. There wasn't anything about made with hands and no hands. and Look, no hands. None of that. Isaiah 53, 7 says, and he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. And so he opened not his mouth. You see, it was prophesied that the Christ would come, the Messiah, the one who would be our savior, would come and he wouldn't be an arguer. He wouldn't be out in the street arguing. In fact, a bruised reed and a smoldering wick. You guys know these scriptures. And this is written long before Jesus ever shows up. And then when he shows up, we can look back and go, aha, that's what they were talking about. And then again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? By the way, you have to know something about the Jews. They don't write the name of God and they don't speak the name of God. So they refer to him kind of in a, in a roundabout way. The blessed is, is who they're referring to as God. And Jesus said, I am which is the sacred Hebrew name for who God is. It's his revealed name to Moses on the mountain. Moses said, listen, you're going to send me in. I don't even know your name. He goes, tell him I am sent you, which is a little crazy. And Jesus answers, I am. And then he answers, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power. He's speaking of God, the father and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then, with, then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. You see, Jesus was convicted and charged and was heading for execution, all without a vote, all without having a legal proceeding, except these folks were no longer able to put to death people for blaspheme because they overused it, as you can see. And the Romans said, you can't do that anymore. You guys are just out of control. You're not allowed to do that. So now they're going to take Jesus and turn him over, but they feel they can do whatever they want with him. And so they beat him and they mock him and they spit on him. I mean, I, I have trouble sharing a glass with a stranger. My goodness. They spit on Jesus on his face and they beat him and they blindfolded him and made fun of him. They mocked him. They pretend worshiped him. All in mockery. You want to talk about having a cruel heart. And it may have been that the guy whose ear was put back on and healed was part of it. Can you imagine? Somebody that God touches their life and changes them like that. And the next thing you know, they can be part of beating him down. You may have met people like that people that have left the church and how you can turn your back on Jesus is, is just a wonder to me. So without voting, they condemn him and they're supposed to vote each one individually and they're supposed to record it, but they cry out and say, you know, who's with me? And they all say, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's not a court proceeding at all. And what happens is the high priest tears his clothes. Tearing your clothes is a form of mourning but see, the high priest is wearing clothing that doesn't belong to him. 
It belongs to the office of the high priest. And it's against the law, the Old Testament law, for a high priest to tear his clothes. But he tears his clothes anyway in a dramatic effort. The interesting thing is when he tears his clothes, it's actually a metaphor for what's happening because the priesthood is being torn away from Israel. We're going to see later on when Jesus is crucified that the veil in the temple is also torn. And we see that the sacrificial system then comes to an end there in 70 AD when they have no more temple and it's gone. So there's this tearing of the high priest as they lay into Jesus and have their way with him. An innocent man by everyone's reckoning. Why did they say he was a blasphemer? Because he claimed to be equal with God. People say, oh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, then why did they condemn him? They said, he says, I am. Then he says, you will see from now on, you're going to see me at the right hand of the Father. You're going to see me up there in heaven, equal with the Father, sitting on the throne with him. If that's not making yourself equal with God and deserving of death, if it's not true, then I don't know what it is. But that's exactly what they did. Now, Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. Apparently she was in the garden. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. That's number one. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. And he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Wow. This was Peter. You remember Peter. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And some say John the, John the Baptist back from the dead. Some say Elijah. Some say a prophet. And he goes, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And then he reminded him, he's going to go to the cross and die. And Peter said, oh, Lord, may it never be. And he said, get behind me, Satan, because he recognized the voice, even though it was through Peter. This is Peter who says, no matter what, Lord, I'll never deny you. The, the one who pulls out a sword and is willing to take on a whole army He's suddenly, he's suddenly a, a lamb. He's got no backbone at all. And so he gets found out. He's intimidated by a servant girl where he won't confess that he identifies with Jesus. And he begins to swear and to curse. Now, swearing and cursing to you and I is like what truck drivers do and sailors do and um, bar flies and so forth and Hollywood people, right? <laughs> Swearing is saying, you know, the pick a, pick a letter of the alphabet, that word. <laughs> there's an A word, there's a B word. There's a, you can go through the entire alphabet and then leave people wondering. That's not the kind of swearing. It's I swear before God, I make a solemn oath that I don't know this man. That's the kind of swearing he's doing. That's how vehement he was denying having anything to do with Jesus. What would cause me to do that? Would it be a gun to my head? Would it be the threat of the loss of a job or um, jail time for speaking the word of God? What would it take for me to deny that I identify with the Lord Jesus Christ? I asked that question. Well, Peter is full of cursing and swearing. It's a different Peter. 
And he says, I do not know the man in which you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed. And you know how weird that is? Roosters were not allowed in Jerusalem. It's like pigeons in New York City are okay, but there are certain places you should never have pigeons and they try to get rid of them. Geese, they have companies which will come and get rid of the geese that are flocking around your... This is what roosters were in Jerusalem because they made an awful mess on all of the holy grounds. And so they were forbidden. And yet there's a rooster there. And he crows two times before he's denied three times. Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him that before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When he thought about it, he wept. It's actually more than that. Mark gives us just the abbreviated version in Luke chapter 22. He says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Peter went out and wept bitterly. Jesus is being beaten and abused. And Peter is standing afar off, being warmed by the enemy's fire and denying that he has anything to do with him because he's afraid that's going to happen to him. And so he, Jesus turns and makes eye contact with Peter on the third strike and Peter runs out of the praetorium, out of the temple area. Can you imagine what Jesus' look was? I don't think it was angry. I don't think it was, I told you so. I think, I think he sympathized with Peter. Because that's just the way Jesus is, isn't he? In Proverbs 3, 5 to 8, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. If you're going to rely upon your own wit, your own strength, your own convictions, you will fail yourself. Amen? Amen. Do you trust yourself? That's why I don't walk into a bakery. <laughs> That's why I don't want to go shopping when I'm hungry. Because I don't trust myself. I'll make bad decisions, right? Do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It's going to be health and life to you if you trust the Lord instead of yourself. Peter was trusting in his own strength. And grabbing a sword, his ability to fight all of them men who came after Jesus. And he was taking matters into his own hands. He said, I will never deny you. And yet here he is denying three times before the rooster crows twice in Jerusalem. And Jesus then makes eye contact with him. I, that, that, would, that would make me weep bitterly as well. Chapter 15 begins with his secondary trial, and I didn't think that would be enough, and so I prepared some more. <laughs> immediately, <laughs> immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a, con a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate, by the way, this is his third trial. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said to him, it is as you say. We would say in Jersey, you said it. You said it, brother. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? 
See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Pilate said, this guy is different. Because he has criminals come before him all the time, and he's kind of like judge, jury, and executioner. He can do anything he wants. He's the boss. In fact, he has a habit of doing such a thing, and he's offended Caesar twice already. Once he took money out of the temple treasury for some business he wanted to take care of, and the Jews revolted. That was a big no-no, and Caesar said, you better keep control of these people. And then what he did is he went into the temple with an image of Caesar, which is a graven image as far as they're concerned, and he's lifted himself up to say that he's God. And so that was an affront to them, and there was another riot because of his thoughtlessness. And so right now, he's two strikes. <laughs> and now they're putting this Jesus character in front of him. And he's like, what do I do? They're crying out for his death. Are you the king of the Jews? Yep. Does Pilate have a problem with that? Nope. You could be the king of the Jews, these worthless people. What are you going to do about it? You have an army? No, oh, I didn't think so. You see, Jesus was passive. He wasn't a threat. It wasn't like he was bearing a knife and trying to kill like a lot of the zealots were. The zealots were people who would constantly try to, in the middle of a crowd, just stab a Roman officer and just blend in like nothing ever happened. These are assassins. Jesus wasn't like that. And they were making all of these accusations. And he goes, do you see how many things they're saying against you? It doesn't matter how much they say about you, right? It's whether it's true or not. Amen. And Jesus didn't even dignify it with an answer. But when he asked, are you the king of the Jews? He answered, you said it. When the priest asked him, are you the son of the blessed? Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the blessed? He says, I am. You see, when he's asked a direct question of truth, he answers. But he's not going to defend himself against false accusations. I learned a lesson from this. Amen. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them. This is Pilate, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Like, don't you want your king? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. You see, Pilate was a sharp guy. He recognized who Jesus was and who these men were, who were breaking all their own laws trying to get this innocent man killed. He knew and he saw through it. We see from one of the other gospels, his wife comes up in the middle of all this and she whispers, have nothing to do with this innocent man. I have been troubled with dreams of him last night. So Pilate's getting it from his wife saying, you better not do anything to this guy. I've had dreams about him and he's an innocent man. So Pilate's already seeing through some of the charade but his wife is also telling him what's going on. Pilate is a picture of a person who knows better, but doesn't act better. He doesn't put faith, but he knows. Like, oh, I know, I know about Jesus. I knew he was a historical figure. He came, he died on a cross, supposedly rose from the dead and, you know, did a jolly dance across all of Jerusalem. Yeah. But it's a different thing to trust in the person of Jesus. It's a far different thing than knowing about Jesus. And he knew that they were turned over. He was turned over because of envy. And so now there's this choice. You got Barabbas, who's a murderer. He's a known murderer. Do you want me to release him and let him go? That's got to bother the people. Here's this brutish man who's going to be a killer out on the street. Should I let him go? Or should I release the king of the Jews? Don't you want the king of the Jews? It sounds like he's a salesman trying to sell something. He, you know, I need to make my quota here. <laughs> Barabbas means son of the father. 
Bar means son. Abbas is like Abba, Abba father. He's the son of the father. I thought Jesus was the son of the father. Jesus is the son of the father. In fact, history records that Barabbas, his first name is actually Jesus. Yes, but they call him Barabbas to differentiate. Jesus, the son of the father, but you know what he is? He's a false Christ. He's an antichrist. John 8, 44, Jesus says to those who are railing on him, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Then when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources or he speaks in his native tongue for he is a liar and the father of it. So Barabbas is a son of the father, but his father is the devil. He's a very picture of the Antichrist, who's a murderer, because his father is a murderer from the beginning, who is the devil. So you have a choice. And you know, don't we all have this choice? Amen. We have this choice. Are you going to follow are you going to follow the true son of God, the son of the father? Or the false son of the father. You know, there'll be an antichrist who comes and lies to people and he speaks smoothly and people will be deceived and follow him until he sets himself up in the temple to be worshiped as God. And then everybody's going to go, oh boy, we made a bad choice. The Jews in the end times are going to realize that Jesus is the Messiah and they're going to turn to him. Anyway, I'm going all the way to the book of Revelation. Fast forward. <laughs> Sorry. So they hand him over because of envy, and here's this Barabbas. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that they should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And so they cried out again, Crucify him. And then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. And so Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. So he lets a murderer go to be politically correct. You know, we do all sorts of things to be politically correct in this world. We'll call people things that they're clearly not. I would love to identify as a tall, slender man. <laughs> and yet, you know, that's not the truth. To be politically correct, he took a murderer and let him loose. And he took Jesus and had him whipped. To the place where he was so beaten and so marred, according to Isaiah, that he was barely recognizable as a man. From the beating he already received to the beating he's going to get now on the social secular side, Jesus was so marred that he didn't even look like a man. And the soldiers then led him away into the hall called the Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. By the way, a garrison is 600 men. So he's called to a giant open area and 600 men, the barracks are cleared to come out and harass Jesus. And they clothed him with purple. It's the color of royalty. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. It's a mockery of him being the king of the Jews. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him on the head with a reed. It's like carrying a baseball bat. And spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him. Just as the blood began to coagulate and put on his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. 
This is how Jesus was treated, an innocent man who performed miracles, who healed, who taught, who loved, because they couldn't stand to look at him. Don't be surprised if people treat you like that because you're a Christian. We're going to have a baptism today. And a bunch of people are going to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. With his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. It's a very difficult thing to live that out. You can ask Peter when you see him. And so they hand him over. The interesting thing is, if you remember in the garden, when Eve and Adam sinned in that order, the Lord came out in the cool of the evening and he said, Adam, where are you? And Adam was hiding because he was naked and he tried to cover himself up with some leaves, which is not a good fashion statement and is not very efficient for tender parts. And he says, I'm here, Lord. And he goes, why are you hiding? Well, because I was naked. Oh, yeah? Who told you you were naked? I, I love the Lord just asking all these seem like innocent questions, and he knows the answers already. And he says, well, that woman that you gave me <laughs> is defective merchandise. She gave to me of the tree that you told me not to. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. What was that, Adam? And I ate. So at last he takes responsibility after he blames the woman and blames God, you know, the woman that you gave me. <laughs> By the way, don't try that, men. <laughs> it didn't work with Adam. And then he goes to Eve and says, what is this that you have done? And she said, the serpent deceived me. And then God then pronounces curses because of sin now on the earth. He tells the man, the ground which you were assigned to, to take care of, to rule over, the ground will not yield its fruit as it once did. It will be infested with thorns and thistles. You see, Jesus is removing the curse by wearing a crown of thorns, which is a symbol of the curse. And Jesus is taking the curse upon himself. The instrument in which the Romans used is called a flagrum. A flagrum is what you might know as a cat of nine tails. It's a leather whip that has metal ball bearings w w kind of woven into it along with sharp bits of metal and glass. They would strap you up to a pole and they would strap your arms high so that you couldn't move. And if you were seeing the thing come, you, you couldn't get out of the way. And they would whip you on your back 39 times. They left the 40th one off for mercy. Many people died just from the beating. Because as it would hit your flesh and as they would pull it off, it would tear strips of your skin off. There are historical documents that talk about how you can see every bone and every rib exposed on the back and all of the tissue that holds the internal organs being removed, internal organs would just fall out of you. This is the beating that Jesus had for you. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement that brings us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. Jesus endured this for you. If you know him, if you've given him your life, and he certainly deserves it, then this applies to you. When I look at this, it breaks my heart because I realize I'm the one who whipped him. It was because of my sin that Jesus was there. Isaiah 50, verses 6 and 7, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face 
from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. This is a prophetic verse about the Messiah who would come, and Jesus is that Messiah. If that doesn't do something to your heart, and that's my desire today, that you guys might have an understanding, a greater understanding of what Jesus did for you and the deep, deep love that God has for you and our response. Isaiah 53, another prophetic verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Do you understand God allowing something to happen? Is God taking responsibility for it happening? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Could you think of taking your son, your only son, and having this punishment that was completely undeserved, this death that was unearned? And yet it pleased God because it would bring us to him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. By the way, it means offspring. It means descendants. And he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. This just hits the nail directly on the head as to why Jesus came. That's what Christianity is about. It's about Jesus Christ coming and taking your place on the cross and you and I taking his place in heaven because we don't deserve it. He got everything he didn't deserve so that we don't have to get what we deserve. Not fair, but the best deal you'll ever get. John 3, 14 to 16, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. He's talking about being up on a cross. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you have that faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you are his. If you don't, you have no right to what Jesus purchased. He gave it all for us. He asked for us to give it all for him. And he certainly deserves it. Amen. Amen. Next week, we're going to look at our king on a cross. We'll talk about that next week. Mm -hmm.